your background a little bit more. I noticed from the time of our investigation, which is around 1979, where you were only about nine years old. Just nine years old, sir. Yeah. So, um, 1980, 85, you're about 15. So, let's look at, let me just ask you a question, from 85 to 91, what was your situation in Liberia? I was still in uh, high school, sir. You are still in high school? Yes, sir. Okay. So when did you join the army? I came. I became an employee of the Ministry of National Defense in uh, 1991. No, but when did you join the army? I was inducted into the army shortly thereafter. So how long was your training program? Uh, we ran the uh, military training. At the time, the training, uh, the training uh, officer at the time at the GTD shop. Uh, in fact, he's probably right here. He, uh, Major Fuma Shalit, Fuma Tia Shalit, was the head of the GTD training section at the Armed Forces of Liberia. He's also now the director there at NSA. He's the director at NSA? President, yes, sir. So, how long was your training? Is what I asked, the first question. Uh, one month, two months, one year? It was year. a three-month stretch, sir. Three months training? Yes, sir. Okay. So with this three-month training program, basic sir, basic training, basic training, initial training, and then and afterwards we we did some special courses. To, your assignment during that period, from '91 to '96, was basically in in the office, right? Not in the field. Uh, until both both field and officer. So after your three-month training, you held an arm. Yes, sir. Okay, and so you were given assignments in the office and out of the office. Oh uh, yes, sir. Okay, so I noticed you say you're a chauffeur for somebody, so that could have been like a bodyguard also. Exactly, a military sir. Military protector. Okay. So during the time of Operation Octopus, what was your situation? Uh, at that time, we uh, I was working uh, closely with the then Defense Minister, who was then Deputy for Operation Brownie J. Sam Samuka or, uh, and Honorable Samuka. Mm -hmm. I worked closely along with uh, him, along with uh, then Deputy for Administration, Alexander Gray at the time, mm -hmm. and uh, our late Dr. Edward B. N. Kessley. Meaning, in protecting the country, somehow you are working as an army man protecting the country or just security as bodyguard or what? I was, I was that brought, operation. Uh, sir, I was brought into the picture because uh, uh, at that time there was some special skills that the government, that the Ministry of Defense saw that they could use at the time. So then I came in. Okay. How about during the April uh, 6th incident for that period of a couple of months where we had that complete chaos in the country? What was your activity then? Again, uh, I wasn't in Liberia for that. Uh, in fact, we, we all left the country simultaneously. In fact, we left uh, 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 Minister Samuka here. DJ Samuka, Minister Samuka, he was the last to leave. In fact, we left him here. When I mean we, I'm referring to, uh, again, Director Fuma Salif, uh, um, uh, Mr. James Madison Tokba, who was also with us at the Ministry of Defense. We had just left the country, I think, like two days before the entire thing erupted. Did you know from ministry intelligence, I mean from military intelligence, that such an act was coming down? Oh, definitely, sir. So you are left in a sense to protect, to protect yourselves from that happening? Uh, affirmative, sir. Yeah, okay. Okay, some may say that you abandoned your post, but anyway, I'll leave that alone. Uh, the next one. Um, from 1996 to the time you started with the ATU, what were you doing? You came back to Liberia when? After I the came 1996? back to Liberia in 2001, sir. 2001. So when you came back, you just went straight into the ATU? Uh, affirmative, sir. Okay. So where were you doing that interval? I was in the, I was in the United States and Ghana. Mm -hmm. well, you, well, could you share with us your activities, the training or just waiting for a chance to come home or what? 
uh, working and uh, waiting for the opportunity to come home. And when the opportunity presented itself, uh, I took it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Was there any particular factor that motivated you to join the army? Uh, I'm, uh, yeah, uh, my family line, my late father was in the security for some 27 years. In fact, my first encounter with a firearm was in 1980. So my surrounding played a very important factor in bringing me to the army and to the security, so to speak, because I was moved by my father. He was my role model. And so I follow in similar suit. Who was your father? Could you mind sharing with us? Uh, the late Samuel Nimley. Samuel Nimley. He served this country uh, at uh, the Bureau of Immigration and Naturalization. Oh, that's good. So then you entered the ATU, and uh, during that time you were there, how long was it? Three years? Four years? Uh, no, uh, from 2001 to August 2003. Well, less than two years. Yes, sir. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you encounter during that time a person by the name of Chucky Taylor? Uh, yes, George Chucky Taylor, very good friend of mine. Okay, what was your working relationship? It was very good, very cordial. What was his position in the ATU? Uh, a military advisor. He was a military advisor. Yes, sir. So he did not go to the front line. He had no responsibility in the front line. He did. He did. We did front lines do this. Oh, so at that time, a military advisor could take a front line role and give command to officers, etc. Oh, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. So at any time, did he give you any commands and orders? Well, he always was right there with me. So basically, we were doing. We were. We were moving uh, parallel with one another. Okay, but I remember earlier when the chair had mentioned whether you knew you worked together with him, you sort of kept his name out of the package, as far as concerned. Oh, no, uh, if I did, then I, I apologize. It was not deliberate. Okay. Uh, Charles Chalky is a good friend of mine. He's, mm -hmm. He continues to be a very good friend of mine. Mm -hmm. So we would say then that during this time we've heard we have on record uh, many incidents of atrocities that was committed by this ATU group. Even though we hear from you that um, this should not have happened and you regret it, but you did confess that it did happen. Yes, sir. So we realized then that a military, the behavior of military is also linked to their training, their discipline, and also the codes and procedures of the unit, how it protects and ensures that its mandates are carried out. So in this case, we can say then that ATU somehow as a unit didn't reflect the type of military rigor and discipline that the Iberia expected from its people. Would that be correct? You are correct, sir. Okay. So then the question comes to mind, and who is responsible for this? Because you have, for example, you said that these people did not come to your group by just them coming. It was highly screened, meaning there was a special recommendation made and you as a training officer were one of those who made sure that these people were properly screened and they were properly trained to carry out this task that they were brought forth to do but yet at the end they didn't they did other things so who are we to hold responsible for this of course they have their own responsibility but from the point of view of the leadership and the the management and of the of the group the trainers etc would you share then that kind of responsibility for those atrocities also I wouldn't, uh, sir, I wouldn't share the responsibility for those atrocities committed, uh, primarily because it's not of my own doctrine to be of such. Now, the issue of who takes the greater blame, institutional-wise, I'm not also skilled in that area to decide who actually takes the blame for an office that have gone contrary to what the, the training doctrine states. Mm. I mean, uh, I would suggest some specialists who can come in and advise you appropriately on what should happen to these institutions that have gone against the doctrine for which they were trained. But for me as an individual, sir, I don't have those special skills or that 
training or that expertise to decide what to happen to units like that. Mm. And but, I wouldn't say just the ATU because there were other units, there were other outfits that operated in this country from 1990 to 2003. You know, I would suggest, sir, that those other units come you know, be, be brought forward also to answer for alleged atrocity, not just the ATU alone. We oh, had the Armed Forces of Liberia that was also being accused of massive uh, 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 human rights abuses. We're talking about soldiers going to churches, allegation also. So I don't see ATU as being the only black goat here on the block. We had other units, we had other offices that did equal what we did at that unit, sir. Well, thank you. I understand your heart. I mean, as I said, we have to take it in a step-by-step -step mode. Yes, sir. You are the one in front of us now. So yes, our sir. questions are geared towards you and the organization you represented as a leader. So, but it doesn't take away the fact that we are giving this opportunity to everyone, as okay, you sir. can see. So the reason I was asking you, because you were a trainee. Yes, so, sir. And you were also, uh, um, would you consider your rank in the ATU to be of what level? Uh, because, as a training officer. Because of the the nature of our operations mm -hmm. i never carried a rank sir okay but you reported directly to the commanding in chief of this country oh yes sir okay so we could say then that you had a direct line to the highest office uh oh uh, yes sir yes sir militarily so if he gave you an order people nobody else would be able to divert from that you would have to be the one fully responsible to carry it out affirmative sir okay now were there times where as you went out in the field you were given command over a group of people to carry out a particular mission? Uh, yes, sir. As a field, uh, field commander? Yes, sir. Okay, so then in that sense, then you held one of the highest positions of responsibility as a leader in the ATU. And then I would take responsibility for whatever that unit did on my watch. Okay, and now that particular unit, could you give me, for example, what was the name of the unit? Uh, sir, those instructions when given to me, uh, it was my prerogative to select a team okay. to go out and execute or to execute that instruction. Whatever expedition that I was placed on, the, uh, the, the element of that expedition depended on my selection. And uh, each of those expeditions were carried out from zero to a hundred and uh, at times we did come back with casualty which is acceptable in our life, in our occupation, in what we do. But uh, those often be a squad or a unit that went on a man watch, uh, made it my duty to keep us focused on our objective. And none of them would have committed any violations under your watch on that particular assignment? If they did, uh, they won't be around. You didn't know about it? No, okay. How about during the time you were training, did you notice there were certain people that were not fit for that assignment and you had to get rid of them, let them not pass the training, or did you usually pass everybody who were brought in for training? Uh, fortunately for us at the time, the guys that came to us at the time were some of the finest commandos and guerrillas that the continent of Africa have ever put out. So they were, they were very good men. They, they all came out with flying cutters. So that means that Africa's finest people are people who commit many atrocities. Well, because obviously this is the reality. I wouldn't leave Wawana out. Hmm? I say I wouldn't leave Wawana out. Wouldn't leave what? Wawanda. I wouldn't leave them out also because... Oh no, I'm just saying Africa as a whole because you're saying that you had some of the best people that this continent had to offer. But yet our records show that some of these best people committed a lot of atrocities. I agree. And and Agreed. I assume that you are teach them the rule of law, you teach them international uh, wars of law, etc. But they just ignored it and under the pressure, they just did what they wanted to do. And that, these were the finest. Unfortunately, sir, that will happen, sir. Okay, I just want to understand that. Okay. And, and it's sad. It's sad that it did. Mm -hmm. No, it's still good. During your tenure uh, with the um, ATU or in any other period, did you observe any economic crimes? For um, example, you did tell us about small things like stealing cassava and stealing this and that, but I'm talking about bigger things, you know, stealing government property, cars, vehicles, or 
looting money, large treasuries from banks or any other issues of that nature? Um, so I only heard. You heard about such heard of these ugly acts that were being committed by uniform, armed uniform personnel. But I've never been personally involved in looting, no. Yeah, I understand that. Did you get well, as to seeing it? Of, mm -hmm. of course, yes. We all have seen it. No, I just thought you may have to remember one particular one that under your oath now you would like to share with us in the interest of helping this country to resolve its past. Well, those, those, uh, I have not come across an incident where there have been mass removal or state funds or state equipment or such things like that. Mm -hmm. I have not been fortunate to have been on a scene where like a bank was broken into or any such thing, no. Okay. Another thing, you noticed, I noticed you mentioned earlier that um, there were a lot of incursions from foreign land on Liberian soil. Yes, sir. So especially from Sierra Leone and Guinea, etc. And so you all had to respond. But at the same time, we see that Sierra Leone is accusing us and our president even of being the first to invade their territory and therefore being involved in these uh, situation of blood diamonds and other issues. So what are we to get from this? It's like the which came first, the chicken or the egg? So were you all responding to these threats or did you initiate the threats and then they responded and then you have to counteract it? What would you say on that issue? Uh, well, sir, um, from the get-go, as history will have told me, if we are to ask who, who drew first blood, yeah. I would say it was the Sierra Leone that did. They drew first blood. Okay, could because you, uh, you if you can that? remember, mm -hmm. it was Ulimo. Ulimo was the first rebel group to have crossed the international border to start hostility in a foreign country, which at that time was Liberia. What so, year was that you were talking about? Uh, Ulimo came in in 1992. Mm -hmm. The Lumio forces came out of Sierra Leone. They were supported by the government of Sierra Leone. They came and crossed our border. So if we are asking who drew first blood, it was the Sierra Leone that drew first blood. What about the RUF issue? That You don't consider that being a problem from the Sierra Leone people's side? A uh, problem in what like, sir? Well, you have two governments. They're both trying to find a peaceful solution. And then you see suddenly RUF allegedly trained by Liberian connected guerrillas going into Sierra Leone to stage a war. And then Ulimbo saying, we came there to defend, to help our brothers in Sierra Leone. And then from there now, we use that as a base to come and solve our problem here in Liberia. So the delicacy of how to show who did first blood and who was right and wrong is complicated. Would yeah, it's, it's a very complicated situation. And mm -hmm. I can only hope that our leaders now can uh, go back to this man on river table and see how best we can become brothers keeper once more. Mm, okay. Because once we are brother keepers, no one will be crossing the nice man fence to take his plum from the tree. Mm -hmm. Okay, regarding weapons that you talked about, do you know where some of these weapons were coming from? The sources of these weapons that were being given to you all? Uh, we don't produce we, such things in Liberia, and neither do we produce such things around here. Yeah, we, we, where they came from? Yeah. This weapon was bought. They were bought from the market, the international market. It's no secret. During the time of what period? What, what period do you Which know? Which period, sir, are you then referring For to? For example, sir? let's go back to the 1992 issue. 92? Two, yes. When you said uh, that Ulimbo was the first and there was a need to defend. At that time, you were working with the Ministry of Defense, right? Yes, I was, uh, I was there along with Major Fumar Salif. Okay, so we had to, we defended ourselves against such an attack. How do we get guns? We just bought it on the market? Or? No, the Air Force of Liberia was still active in defensive positions. Okay. Okay, so we still have weapons that we had from the onset of the conflict. Okay. So, but then in the case of the government of 1997, the issue then became, even though sanctions were on us, we had to break that for self-defense, right? That self-defense, that's, that's what our constitution... You see, our constitution tells us to protect ourselves. Mm. So, if that is what our law says, then we have the right 
to defend ourselves. I don't think it is fair to tie my hands and tell me to stand up and let the next man punch me. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a lot of preservation. I will live. I will try to survive. Mm -hmm. And that's just what we did. Mm -hmm. We tried to survive. Okay, thank you very much. I'll be praying for until now. Mr. Mr. Chairman, with your indulgence, I need to ask the witness a few more questions. I'm Commissioner Pearl Brown Bull again. From your answers uh, given, you said, uh, first, I just want to talk about who spilled the first blood. And I'm giving my, what I have observed based on testimonies here, because you know the TRC is supposed to look at the root causes. We're getting a lot of facts from witnesses that are coming, as well as doing our own research. Because at the end of the day, we really, which is a tedious job, it will not be perfect, but at least we got to call a spade a spade. From the testimony of uh, Minister, uh, Mr. Family, what's your first name? Boyma Family. We will say from that deduction, you talk about 1990 or 91 with Ulimo. But if we go back to 1985, from the testimony of Boyma Family, he said when he came from America, he went to Sierra Leone and Momo, President Momo, gave them ammunition when they came for the Kuyampa evasion. Because Kuyampa didn't come with, I mean, they didn't have ammunition. So they got the ammunition from Sierra Leone. So if we will put things in a historical perspective and our history should be correct, M President Momo gave the ammunition that the Queen Power group came in that invasion. So we would say it went back to 85 when the Sierra Leone president, not talking about uh, people around there, mercenaries or sellers, but the Sierra Leone president. So we should put history exactly where it is. That's where, from what I've heard from sitting there on the oath, that's when the first. Uh, ammunition that we know so far from testimony so we must put things in a proper perspective whether people like it or not but that's what it is secondly you said you took instructions on orders from your commander-in-chief so can you please just tell me what instruction you executed instructions from the order of your commander-in-chief can you give us one example of one of the instructions that the Commander-in-Chief gave you that you executed? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, first of all, to thank you for the first uh, uh, comment you just made. Uh, so if we then look at it, it was Sierra Leone, our brother Sierra Leone, who drew first blood way back in 1985 when I was just 15. So I thank you for that, ma'am. Uh, to answer the second question, one of the instructions given to me by the then Commander-in-Chief was to safeguard uh, his hometown of Arlington. That was one of the uh, one of those assignments that were given me. And the same as to that instruction, you try to execute it, but it failed because Arlington now uh, looks like worse than what it was before 1990. Um, it's unfortunate. It's unfortunate. But I'm all the way from Grand Crew, so I'm far from there. Grand Crew is okay. Yes, despite wherever you are, we are all from, we are all Liberians. And when you take the oath, we're supposed to defend the state. Because one link in the chain, when it's broken, that chain is broken. And in union, strong, success. It sure. Thank you. I wanted to ask that one question and clarify that. Thank you. Well, I want to say thank you, Mr. Nimna, for coming and responding to the queries of the commission. 
I trust that in future, if there is a need to talk to you for um, any other matter, you will avail yourself to the commission. So, well, thank you very much for coming and ask if you have anything else you'd like to say before you leave. Thank you very much, Mr. Commissioner. Uh, what I would like to say to our people, uh, my people, that whatever our differences may be, let us not steal a war no more. Let us not use the barrel of a weapon to settle any form of differences among ourselves. Because at the end of the day, it is our children, and even maybe our children unborn, who will become the direct victims of the wrong decisions that we make. So in closing, I would say let us steady war no more. Thank you, Mr. Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you very much. And you may give thanks to the Commission.